Nation. Um, today we've got our special guest, James Klusky, James Klusky on the line here. How are you doing, James? Good, yeah. Thanks for having me. Delighted to be on. Now, Mark is there in Grace Ogren, um, in Glenageary as usual. We do have one opening question here for James. If you had to pick one U2 album, uh, what would it be? Octone Baby. Octone Baby. I Great to agree. I would agree. Do you, agree well. is there, do you guys concur on that or not? I agree. Yeah, I'd have to. Yeah, I've thought of this question. And it, by the way, James, it's not a question we ask every single <laughs> guest. <laughs> first question. Exactly. And it's probably going to be the hardest. <laughs> It's the hardest question you you'd be asked all, all uh, episode, but um, no. Yeah. All in all, I'd agree. My favorite album. It's it depends. It, okay, the reason just for the guests listening, uh, the reason why we asked that James kind of uh, you know told us that he was a U two fan here when he saw the Mark's uh, great painting of Bono behind us, um, patriotic Bono with the the Irish flag, um, and I just wanted to dig in there because it's something that you know divides the the cohort of uh, of U two fans. Like I'm big. Um, I'm a big kind of Rattle and Hum era uh, fan yeah. as well. I love that. I don't know, I've watched that a million times. Um, I quite like, this is controversial. Like, it depends on, again, it depends on what I'm, what I'm feeling like, but I kind of like the pop album. I like to put that on. Yeah, That's what I listen to the whole thing, you know? Which is undervalued by, uh, I actually have a friend, a Danish friend who's a tennis player who he said to me, pop is his favorite album as well. Wouldn't be my favorite now, but, um, but like there's some gems on, on, on it as well, like yeah. uh, it's one of my uh, favorite even, Bono. Even, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like my my like you know, even the new stuff. Like I always think you meet a YouTube person or you meet a person and you say like you two, they're like, oh, I only, I, lo- I like their old stuff. I don't like their new, you know, I don't like their new stuff. But if you listen to some of the songs live, like some of the you know, like every breaking wave when he's acoustic and that new tour. Like I mean, it's like I'm kind of like, how can you not? think that this is not amazing like mm. so it, i get very uh very frustrated if i, I get into a lot of debates with people so yeah, i played college in, in college in america and um at louisiana and we could play music uh like on the campus right so you play music at the tennis courts and people you know people be walking by to class and stuff and a lot of the guys would like to play rap and everything and i put you two on a lot and i think it's one of those ones it's like the further you go away from ireland the more irish you become right yep. 100%. But um, uh, so my friend who was on the team with me, he is now a head coach in Wichita, in at American College. And I did a webinar for his team last week or a couple of weeks ago, and he said he said to the team, James is the biggest U two fan going, and blah blah blah. And you know, in honor of James, we'll play some U two today at practice, right? And then he asked the team, he's like, out of curiosity, have have, have all you guys heard of U two? And there was a few people on the team that hadn't heard of them. Which oh, I God. thought was. I wish I was them so I could discover it all over again. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Go back into I have, a, I have a 15 year old nephew, Isaac, and he's discovering you too, but he's probably two years into it at this stage. And I was just thinking, he's saying all the same things that I was saying at that age and, and finding, yeah. discovering the new and then going back to the older ones that you skip at the start. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the live stuff that gets me. It's the li- like live, like I listen to one of their songs on an album and I'm like, this is great, but as a band live, I mean, you can't tell me a better band that puts on a band that puts on a better show than them. The yeah. the pity about these days with your nephew Isaac is, you know, there's no rhythm records anymore. I remember going out to rhythm records in town and like getting those bootleg ones from, you know, the show in Bratislava or whatever, and yeah, it's yeah, yeah. real grainy and stuff. And um, those those little bits in between where Bono tells a random story. Or I remember, like, I've listened to some uh, bootleg stuff so much that I kind of think that's the original so i'll be saying well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. i used the, the when he's like bullshitting in between like i remember i have the i have a really good um i had a dvd uh it was live in stockholm but i don't think it was like released broadly they uh, sang abba at that one didn't they, they brought they sang, on the- yeah they brought on abba exactly yeah, yeah. and they uh and you know he ta- keeps on talking about the Swedish jury's decision and I don't know what that's about it's so so local and so uh, you know over the moment but he keeps on mentioning that in songs so when I'm singing the songs I keep on uh, saying it's very strange anyway (laughs) anyway so uh, just do some introductions here (laughs) sorry yeah (laughs) way off okay so uh, James is the the owner of HC Collective um, as well as being an ex uh, professional tennis player Um, also you mentioned as well that you went to university in America something something that me 
Mark and probably every teenage boy in, uh, in Ireland <laughs> kind of dreamed about when we were watching the OC or something. We're like, oh, look at <laughs> yeah. that. Uh, so <laughs> I'd love to dig into that as well. We might, we might actually st- start there. So, you know, let's start, start the, the tennis stuff. You, when did you start your, your tennis journey and, and did, did you always think you're going to be a superstar of it? No, like I started when I was, I started with in, in what's called the Parks Tennis Program. So I'm sure maybe some, some, some of your listeners play tennis in the parks. It was this kind of, it was sponsored by the Kit Kat. Started in that, um, Sword Tennis Club, six, six hard courts, really liked playing tennis. And then basically what happened was then, it, you know, it feeds into the club program and, and um, I started playing the tournaments in Ireland uh, and I was doing quite well in them. You can't see from the, for those listening, they can't see me, but I'm 6'6", six, six, so I was, I've, I've always been quite tall as well. So I was, that obviously helped me a little bit tennis-wise and I was tall when I was young and uh, I was doing well in juniors. And then under, I was always kind of top four in Ireland. And then under probably about 15, Westfoot Clontarf opened. So 14 or 15, I went to, I went to school in Belvedere in town and basically Westwood opened. And that was the, that was really the turning point because, um, and like sometimes you're just lucky in terms of timing, right? But a coach came from Canada, a guy, Larry Jervich, who took over, uh, who, who, who ran Westwood, the tennis program. And there was a core group of, five or six players that were really good and we trained before school we trained after school we trained six days a week really hard and um, I just loved tennis the whole way through and then basically you know the plan was always I wanted to play Davis Cup for Ireland I wanted to play professionally I wanted to be in the top 100 in the world and all that stuff and, and uh, but part of that was a lot of Irish guys would go to college in the States so generations before me it's kind of the, the way forward well kind of trodden path you would have thought about that when you were in like early in secondary school or was that always yeah probably yeah i probably would have yeah i would have thought about it then yeah um and like american colleges are looking for talent obviously they're looking for players to come and uh and uh i played a junior event in miami under 18 the kind of junior world championships and a lot of coaches are there and they're kind of looking for players um and they're you know handing out cards like there's no tomorrow and so I, I, I had a couple of interested colleges um, and then with my coach, Larry, who's the Canadian guy who's, who's now back living in Canada, but he, I went with him to America and we, we, we visited these colleges. Um, I visited three colleges and decided that Louisiana was the place that I wanted to, wanted to go. So four mm-hmm. years in the deep south, um, which was great. What do you think about Mark Baker? Would that be your, where would you, like uh like to land if you're i think louisiana has that kind of cajun vibe that could be uh could be interesting but where would you like to land if you had to in america i don't, I don't know um it's so vast and there's so many different 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 types you know yeah. was was that where was that where you wanted like was there a list of places like and you were like this is number one two three four future yeah like no the, the funny thing happened so the first place i went to was pepperdine in california um which is in malibu actually which was phenomenal like and I went there and, and the coach um, he, <laughs> he's doing pretty good to sell us you know a 17 year old kid he's like oh Pamela Anderson comes and plays tennis sometimes I'm like where do I sign, where do I sign? <laughs> but I, uh, I went there and I really liked it like I liked the coach and stuff I liked the place and the scholarship like it was okay I mean it's expensive there in Malibu as well so so you, you kind of obviously that kind of came into it as well but um but I was like, this is really, really nice place. Then I went to Indiana and I had an Irish, I had a friend that was playing in Indiana um, and I went to Indiana and I was like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. They took me to an American football game, right? And Indiana basketball is quite big and it's very hard to describe to people who haven't been, haven't seen college sports, just how mammoth it is like. But at Indiana, it was my first, kind of one of my first times in America they brought us to a, a football game and there's probably 40,000 people at this football game, right? American football stadium wasn't full. Then they brought us into the basketball, the basketball's unbelievable basketball facility. And I was, I was at the American football and I was like, geez, this is unbelievable, right? This is in, it's never seen anything like it. And then I went to Louisiana and Louisiana, obviously the weather is, you know, hot. So it's good conditions for, for playing and they brought me into the American football stadium and it's 102,000. And uh, like, it's just, 
you know, college football there. I, I said to people, it's like, it's like putting a hundred thousand stadium in the center of Kilkenny and the, and the, the hurlers play there every week. You know, it's like these, you know, you just, everyone gravitates towards the, towards the football and it's a real college town. It's 50,000, 50,000 students. Um, and it's just an amazing, and, and to be fair, like, I mean, it wasn't like I met loads of Irish people down there. Like it's not, it's not, you don't find that many Irish people in Baton Rouge. So, um, I had an incredible experience and, and the team was, the team was great. You know, it was, we were top 10 in the country tennis wise. Um, and uh, yeah, it was amazing. Like, And what's the, what's the lifestyle? Like, is it like when we were growing up, we saw these people go to college. We saw the kind of, the only kind of window that we had, we didn't really have the internet back then. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, the only window we had was the kind of the TV shows or uh, like the American pie movies. Like, is that, is that type of thing? <laughs> On uh, on campus, are people you know going out to like kegger parties and stuff like that, or is it? Yeah, way I mean, it's obviously like, it's obviously like, exaggerating a little bit in terms of like that's that, but not not. I mean, and definitely for, there was a guy in our team who was in a fraternity. Some of the girls are in sororities. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, yeah. I mean, you've you've thousands of eight between eighteen and twenty two year olds. So this. So okay. gonna, like you know it's it's a it's a fun place there's college bars the, the the great thing about louisiana is it's 18 um in a lot of the bars it's 18 to get in and wow. 21 to drink so when you when you when you go at 18 they'll put an x a big x on your hand if you're under 21 and they'll give you a wristband if you're if you're uh if you're over 21 so mm-hmm. but a lot of people end up in there with x's on their hands and uh, drinking like you know so so um uh, so, like if I could, if I could go back in time and go, some, you know, pick somewhere to go in my life, I'd go to be an eighteen-year-old going to college again. To be honest, and live that experience. Oh, when you were in when you were in school, James, over here, were, were the blinkers on? This is what you wanted to do. You believe that's that's where you were going, or what was Plan B if that didn't happen? Just out of interest. Yeah, um, I suppose there was no there was no real Plan B in terms of college was where I was going to go. Like I was, you know, some people go prof- play professionally straight. They don't go to college. That was mm. never really, it was, it was go to college and, and play with really good players, pl- train in good weather. You know, the team was in the top 10 in the country. Like it was, it was kind of the place I wanted to, um, I wanted to go, you know? Um, mm. So plan B probably wasn't really a plan B at that time, to be honest. I'm being brutally honest, you know, and like I was good enough to, 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 I knew I was good enough to go to college in the States. Like uh, I definitely was at that level. Like, so, so I knew I would find somewhere. And I suppose that is, you know, you are getting a degree as well. So you are going to college. Um, but I was saying to someone, I don't know what your guys experience if you, if you even went to college, like, but like from my experience, it's like you, you, you learn as much, like I learned as much kind of time management and, dealing with pressure on the tennis court and we had 6 a.m. weights and just managing your life, like as opposed to actually just reading from a book and, and learning, you know, about business or whatever, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a lot of growing up there. Um, but it, it was an amazing experience and, and something I'll remember forever. Like class. And then how, what's the, the transition that you're coming to the end of your, your university um, and then, you're you're kind of you want to go professional or is that kind of something that you have to get enough points towards and in, in tournaments or how does uh, that- yeah no 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 one like anyone can anyone can turn professional um it's and then you 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 enter into these professional tournaments so like for me in college i was i was ranked three in american doubles so doubles was more my kind of game and then i was a good you know i was a good singles player as well but doubles was probably my my better thing and uh so you kind of in the summer is when you're in college, you kind of play, I would play pro events um, and you can't at the time you couldn't take the money either. So you can't take the prize money because you're an amateur. And okay. um, so I would play these tournaments in the summer. So you kind of know where you're le- like your level, a good college player is you'll move up the rankings. You should move up fairly quick. Um, okay. Now in tennis, there's a couple of thousand people ranked, but like it's hard to get a ranking point, you know, so it's hard to get ranked initially. Um, so you're kind of going to these events. It'd be like me, well, sorry, in this world, we can't go anywhere, but like, you're like me going to a tournament and you're, you're in qualifying and then you have to get through qualifying. You have to win a match in the main draw and then you get a ranking point and you're 
you feel like God's gift, you know, and then you're trying to, you're trying to basically climb the ladder of going, going through, going, going up the rankings. Cool. Um, okay. So after college, you, you kind of committed to that or was that kind of something that you had to make a decision, say, I'm going to go all in on this or is it something that, you know, yeah, like I was, I was committed to it during college. It was always the plan that that was the next step that I would, I would uh, kind of college was used as, as a stepping stone onto the pro tour. And I actually had a ranking. I had a ranking already. Like I'd done okay in the summers. I played, I think I, play, I, I played in Armenia and Georgia and I, I'd done decently. I did, did okay. So yeah, it was never like, it was ne- not that it was never in doubt, but I always was like, oh, I'll play for a year or two as, you know, and it's a way to see the world as well, right? You know, you could, you, you know, your tennis racket can bring you a lot of places. So it was a way to kind of, yeah, see the world. It's, it's such an interesting sport as well, because it's like, it's po- it's popular in Ireland, but there's, I think there's a lot more people that could be playing this. And it, like you said, there's a, a way to go to America, way to see the world uh, with tennis racket people aren't really thinking about. Um, you know, we're we're having a you know a child soon, um, and we're thinking about what what uh, sports to force them into. And I think tennis might be uh, after hearing about this LSU uh, thing. I think this might be the way to so, go. So my, like I don't have any kids or anything, but my advice would be yeah, tennis is uh, it's a like I, I sat on a board actually for tennis Ireland before like a committee a couple of years ago, and I was saying like look the success of Irish tennis is the people that go to college in the States. So I have friends that went to Harvard and Yale and, you know, these kind of really good colleges academically, but you know, it opens so many doors for you to go to college in the States, I believe anyway. Um, and yeah, it's a really good option. Uh, and, and especially on the, on the girls side as well, the, the, the colleges in America, they're like really looking for, for, for female players. Um, so it's, it's, uh, there's good, there's good opportunities for players to go, go to the States. James, is, is there any difference now with, with tennis in 2020? Well, besides what's going on, but I mean, the amount of people interested in it now, how popular it is, and maybe compared to, you know, 15 years ago in Ireland. Yeah. So I, I've been speaking to some of the clubs actually, and the, like the memberships are booming because of COVID, because people had nothing else to do. Like, yeah, so. my kids. I have two. I have two. I have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old, and my eight-year-old daughter uh, started tennis. Which which club is she in? Uh, well, it was just down in Shankill. Um, oh, okay, very good. Yeah. Yeah. So it was it was a good sport where you don't actually have to touch anyone. <laughs> yeah. So, exactly. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. It's, it, it, and that's what's happening is clubs are, you know, clubs are booming because, the, uh, you know, I spoke to one or two coaches and they said they, they're struggling to fit people in for, for lessons. Um, but one, one thing that, like, so, so tennis is booming in terms of, like, probably, I think what happened is, is, like, the people that played when they were a kid, I think statistics show, like, people play when they're younger, then they quit, then they come back later in life, like. Mm-hmm. So, and I think it, it kind of accelerated some people, you know, who maybe played when they were a kid, didn't play for 15, 20 years, then COVID hits, tennis and golf are the only options. Oh, I'll give ten, you know, I'll dust off the tennis racket here. So I think that's kind of what happened. Um, but one thing at the moment is like the, the, the guidelines, like <laughs> the outdoor courts are open, but indoor courts across Ireland are closed and gyms are open so i don't like i don't understand it like it's it's you know if you're open in the gyms which is fine i've no problem with the gyms being open but you need to open the indoor tennis courts like it's a it's a social you know it's socially distant it's it's um you're at 20 meters away from your opponent there yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean it's like it's in my opinion it's it's ridiculous that they've closed the indoor courts um and i know one club who have a gym have put a lot of the gym equipment on the indoor tennis courts and people are using the indoor tennis courts like you know as the, as the gym like but the, the indoor tennis courts are closed so it doesn't make any sense to me so it's something then, i think tennis are fighting to try and have them open it's uh because it's it's funny that a lot of people are getting involved here in greystones as well there's a, a club near me and um mm. my my wife's friend uh, and her husband joined and they, they have like a you know like a kind of beginners improvers league or something yeah, yeah. Uh, and they had a clean sweep of that uh, this year, so I I don't think they know this yet. But me and Katie are gonna we're gonna get some lessons, and next year we're coming for them. Uh, <laughs> so they, they're on notice. Anyway, to, yeah, to create James. a rocky rocky training montage video of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> he likes his montage videos. We know that from his Instagram. 
yeah. just just to, when we're discussing um like high performing or successful sports people i'm always interested in what goes into how, how are they so good compared to everybody else right so there's obviously exposure to right place right time type of mm. thing um there's motiv- motivation from uh just themselves and parents you know pushing them into mm. things that's always good there's having a keen interest mm. um being obsessed um mm. then there's physical attributes is there is there any what what would be the key kind of f- physical attributes you mentioned you're very very tall is, yeah is, what 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 does a good good tennis player look like naturally yeah like uh, to the, the first part of your question like for me i think it's for me the most important thing is you're surrounded by good people like good like tennis is an individual sport but like it doesn't really matter if it's tennis or business or whatever but like that you have people that encourage you you know that 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 you have a good group around you so like my i guess my one of my favorite quotes has always been surround yourself with the people you want to become you know so i was lucky that timing wise in dublin we had a good group of players that were kind of encouraging each other along and and encouraging but also really competitive around each other so i think that's really important because it's a like sport can be lonely business can be lonely like i think you need people that are encouraging you telling you the truth um all, all that stuff like um is really important and then physical attributes in tennis like i mean i'm i'm not like i'm not a great athlete or anything like i would never claim that but i, I it's an interesting sport because there's actually a lot of there's a mix of 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 heights and people's you know there's diego schwartzman who's doing very well is like five seven or five six or you know so and then there's john isner is six foot ten so kind of no one size fits all i mean generally if you said like create an ideal tennis player probably be about six one i'd say like a ridiculous athlete but um i think in terms of like performance and lessons that you know non-sports people can learn i think surround yourself with good people being strong around your goals and your vision and what, what you're trying to achieve and really going after that and and uh yeah, there's no like, there's no magic bullet, I guess. You know, a, a lot of it would, be, I imagine, when you get to that level, is in your own head, like kind of like in golf. I'd imagine you could kind of put yourself off. It's kind of mm. your own fault. Would that be right in saying? You know, do you have to work on your your mind a lot during? Yeah, you know? definitely. Like, I think I think imposter syndrome is a, is a big, you know, is a big thing of of you know, and I, I probably went through that a little bit. I think everyone goes through, you know, where you, you're not sure if you're good enough. You're not sure if you belong. You're not sure if you're, I think we're all fighting our, you know, whether it's walking into a business meeting or onto, onto a tennis court or whatever it is. I think we're all fighting our like inner, inner voice and our demons around. Are we good enough? Are we not? Um, I was lucky enough. I did a, I did a training camp in India um, well, it, I got sick now one of the times, but uh, that's enough, that's probably for another podcast. But uh, I did a training camp there uh, pre-season um, over Christmas a couple of times, and two of the guys who were in it, Mahesh Bhupathi, Rohan Bopana, they were top top ten in the world. And Mahesh has won Wimbledon, he's won all the all the Grand Slams, and like he, they're doubles guys. And I remember saying to someone after I came from that camp. I remember saying like I learned as much kind of going for lunch with them and hanging out with them as I did on the tennis court, you know, like whether you, the actual technique and shots and stuff, just that kind of mindset around thinking big, you know, just the way they kind of carry themselves, the way they, the way they train, the way they show up for, for practice. And, um, you know, I think like, you know, you do the same exercise as me for your shoulder, for example, but like, I think, professional athletes you know they the mindset have been just incredibly disciplined and dedicated um and if i could tell one story one guy i played this guy max murney who was uh he was number one in the world in doubles and he was top 25 in singles his nickname is the beast of belarus so he's from 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 minsk and just a legend like and I, he was one of my heroes growing up um and he'd be a good bit older like and it was kind of the end of his career and I played him in Davis Cup for Ireland and uh, I remember like they would his team would practice at at say say they were practicing at 10 o'clock like Max was there you know half eight warming you know he's just so focused 
And then I remember we played them again. And on the Sunday night, our team was going out for dinner and we were in the same hotel. And I was on the same floor as the gym in the hotel. And it was like eight in the evening and Max was going into the gym, you know? And I'm like, that's, that's like, somebody's not more talented, but like, he's, he's just a, a beast, you know, or he's just, mm. it's a discipline obsessed. that you need, like obsessed. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So that would be, and, and I think it's the same with business people. I think you have to have the same with entrepreneurs, with people leading teams, all that stuff, you know, it's, it's, it's there's no magic, magic formula. Like. So interesting. And the, one of the things that you said to me there or said, uh, uh, before was the there's a Guinness Book of uh, World Records for the longest uh, doubles match. Is that the is that the title of it? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. we did that. We, so is how like did a, it come about? Like clip as well. Like, is it like uh, what's what's set the scene for us here? It's like uh, the epic battle. Set the scene. So the scene was a couple of Irish guys had attempted this world record a few years ago, um, and the record was 57 hours continuous tennis. Okay. five minute break per, per hour and they did 33 hours and one of them got cramped right and i kind of saw i was still playing professionally at this time and i saw that and i was like geez this is quite this is interesting you know and then basically i finished playing professionally i was playing a little bit of tennis i was dossing around and then i was like oh i need to do so i need to do something like you know um and i had this idea thought about like, okay, will I run a marathon? Will I do, you know, I was just trying to think of something I wanted to do. And then I just remembered this world record and thought, why don't we, why don't we go for this? Um, so I approached a guy, Dave Mullins, who was on the Davis Cup team, the generation before me. Now, if he had said, leave me alone, I'm not sure if I would have like gone chasing people to do it, but he said, yeah, let's, let's do it. Um, and then we found two other guys, Dan O'Neill, uh, Luke McGuire and, we we trained for it like it was tough to train for because we were stepping into the unknown you know like we didn't didn't really know what was so we did kind of like 10 15 hours in a row in the lead up so we did practice for it but it was uh it was brilliant like and we raised money for 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 charity now the so it was great and it was kind of i've never i don't know if either of you guys have ran a marathon i've never kind of gone through the that experience of like going through the wall and all that stuff so when we got to the end, we, we probably could have gone a little bit longer, like, but we, 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 anyway, we were bollocks at the end of it, but um, we just found out one of the guys sent, now our group hasn't been active, but one of the guys sent a message, some four people in Australia after breaking the record. Ah, oh, no. devastating. So, so we're thinking about getting the band back together now. <laughs> one more, one more. Yeah, one like, well, we, we got one more punch, you know. Wow. Like, it is like a rocky scenario. We're like, or we could do it together. You get those guys in Australia in a kind of, a, you know, a, you know, a, have the the court yeah. going right beside you and say, okay, let's just do this. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, I was okay, cool. Um, hitting the wall. The we've never ran marathons, but we did as part of the Shark Pod. We did a, a half Ironman in August. Oh, uh, wow. Mark Baker. When I was when well, I did it. Uh, Mark was uh, there supporting me at the end. Um, the bag of chips actually in my hands. Yeah, I, uh, I was doing my final lap and then I saw him eating a bag of chips and I just thought to myself, this is uh, like Mark's on holiday here, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I had another one to go and they thought it was over and it wasn't. It was, uh, it was tough. Hello. You know, it was fun at the same time. Um, but yeah, okay. So now that the, the, the tennis uh, is over, it's, it's uh, you know, you, you had your, uh, your professional kind of run. Um, mm -hmm. At this stage, do you, are you kind of thinking, okay, what's next? Do uh, like any professional sports person, is that kind of a, a hard couple of months when you're trying to say, okay, this is kind of behind me. What's in the future? Or are you always kind of having one eye on on the, uh, the outside world? Yeah, like it, it's a really good question, and, and I kind of didn't really know what I wanted to do. So initially, I kind of coached a little bit, um, and yeah, you're kind of you're kind of trying to find your way. Like I was explaining to someone that you know you you you're so focused and you have a vision around your sport and you're so focused on you're trying to climb this mountain like and when that ends it's almost like you're trying to find well where's the next mountain like what am i what am i climbing now like what am i like i'm so i was so driven by my ranking and by you know so what what's next you know so so i definitely kind of went through a period where i wasn't really sure but i i was very lucky like and i was very lucky tennis has opened a lot of doors and tennis is 
there's a lot of you know great business people that that, that play the sport as well and I, I have a lot of like good mentors and stuff and I was lucky in 2015 that when I was stopping to play um I, I heard about this event basically on Richard Branson's island on, on Necker Island and I, I like it's it's amazing where one phone call can lead and I'm sure there's people listening that are unsure about whether they should make a phone call to someone or whatever but there's a company that run this event on Necker and um, Branson's a huge tennis fan and I heard about this event and, and I thought, wow, geez, how can I talk my way into this one? Or how can I, is there an angle here? Right. So event, essentially the event is, is on his island. There's 16 pros. So there's like Novak Djokovic, Nadal, Carolyn Wozniacki, people who've won grand slams. And then there's 16 business people who, you know, come and, you know, the founders of tech companies and, and so on. Uh, so I, I basically called this guy, Trevor, and, and said, look, I'd love to come and help out at this event. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll stand on the tennis court all day so that you're not going to be short a, um, a play, like when Nadal's off in the sea or whatever, having his drinks, you won't be short a, a player. So he basically came back and was like, okay, yeah, come. So that was 2015. I arrived for that event. Um, and when I think of where that has, le- what that has led to me in terms of my, in terms of my career, like that picking up that one, making that one phone call. Um, so went there, the most incredible event I've ever been to. Um, and then basically got an, got an email. I met, obviously I met Branson there. I actually, ironically enough, so 2015, I'd just gone to a U2 gig and I knew, knew that he was, he, he is friends with, with Bono or knows Bono. So, I said to him, uh, my like opening line with him was like, "Oh, I went to I went to see you two in Dublin there last week," and he's like, "Oh, did you? Was was it any good?" And I was like, "Yeah, it was. I think they're getting better. You know, I think they're getting better with age." And he's like, "Oh, I'll tell Bono you said that." <laughs> I was like, <laughs> "I was like, oh, brilliant, you know." Thank you. Give Bono my number. Uh, yeah, I get it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'll tell I'll tell him for you, Richard. Um, but um, and then so what happened was I got an email about a month later from the guy who runs the island, and he asked me to come back out and and um, and coach Branson tennis. So wow. I was very lucky to, to to go and do that a number of times, and and uh, so I'm very grateful for to tennis. What tennis has been able to hang around someone like him and the different people that I've met, whether it be entrepreneurs in Ireland or or. Oh, I just you know people that I can ask for advice and so on. So so that that kind of really helped me in terms of what I was doing next. It's a uh, it's an amazing thing because we were actually talking to somebody else who had been on uh, the island for I think some other reason. But um, it seems like Richard Branson has this thing where he's I think he might have like personally interacted with the most people in the world. As in I don't know <laughs> he seems to be involved in everything. He's going yeah. space. He's doing the the what's the the hyperloop stuff. Yeah, Virgin Hyperloop. Yeah, yeah. Oh, jeez, I remember. <laughs> I remember once, right? So, I'd, I'd, um, I play tennis with him every day, and like he, I mean, he's great. Like I played him twi- twice a day, like, and uh, I remember saying to him, like, oh, you know, you'd have a cup of tea with him in the morning, like, and I'd say, oh, what are you, Richard? What are you, what are you doing now? And he's like, oh, uh, I've got a meeting. We're trying to put more satellites in orbit to bring Wi-Fi to poor people around the world. <laughs> He's like, what are you oh, doing? And he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm just, you know, call home there. <laughs> you know, so uh, he's, he's, uh, his energy, like, that was the one thing that still stays with me is the guy is like, he just never stops, you know, he never, he's, he's, he's got that sports mentality, like he's relentless, you know. Like, but he still, he still has time to play tennis during the day. You know, he's not obviously working 24 seven. He's still doing what he wants as well yeah and, and i think that's a re- like i think it's a really good point and it's actually a really good lesson and it's something that i took like if you want to, like a lesson that i took is i play tennis most mornings before work and i play obviously i talked about earlier i play indoors and obviously the indoor courts are closed like but um he i said it to him before and he's like he feels that he's more productive work-wise if he's physically active um and like I oh I found with him so it's like tennis his he kite surfs as well, um, he, so he would always do something physically active in the morning and he always do something in the evening and he feels like he's more productive work wise and it's like it's non negotiable in his diary you know so he always does it, um, and then the second piece I I kind of took from him as well is like 
you know, I remember going to a business meeting in Dublin where the person had their phone on the table and the lights going off and they're like kind of talking to me and they're like, Oh, you know, I just need to send this. And like, he never really has a, he never has a phone with him on the Island. Now I know he has like, he has a PA and stuff and, and he has support and everything, but like, he's very present when he's with you. Like, mm. so his conversation, um, I just remember thinking like, this guy's one of the busiest people in the world yet. He makes sure he has his, he makes sure he plays his sport and, Thanks. And he's not like distracted. And has he, so much. has he always been like that, James? Do you know, or is it something that he's, he's kind of added well, to his? Yeah. Uh, to, so I did, I actually did. So I would always keep a journal when I spent time with him as well. And I'd always kind of ask him questions and try and capture it. Like, and, and I, I did say to him, so his tennis level, he wouldn't be in a, like, he, he would be. He, he's not he's, listening. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 i was like oh i better cut myself that's my that's my invite rescinded like he wouldn't be amazing in that he pl- he started playing tennis when he was 30 years old so he started kind of later which is a t- it's a tough sport like tech you know if you didn't play as a kid right and but he loves it and i did say it to him once and he goes oh, I, was t- I was too busy like or you know kind of so i'm get- you know he was obviously manically busy but i think he's He's all I'll say is he's, he's very focused on his on his physical fitness, like, and he's um, and he's very and I he also say he, he, like I don't think he I don't, I couldn't see him ever retiring like I think he just sees it as all as fun you know like he loves to he loves he loves ideas loves meeting people loves hearing hearing about ideas um, and and uh, yeah brilliant like brilliant person. Um, Necker Island, like that's always associated with tennis. Like, is there what else goes on, goes on over there? Um, yeah. So I mean, there's 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 so they would do stuff. So in the summer, usually he would kind of invite people over. So he would invite friends over. So you could have celebrities. You could have you could have famous business people. Then sometimes groups rent the island for 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 from him for they might do events like think tanks or business events and so on. So there's lo- always loads going on. You know, at that tennis event, which is in, which is in December, um, they have the tennis, then they have a private concert. They usually have a, a, a superstar kind of singer come in or, so it's all like, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a hive of ideas. And I always think like with him, it's like these guys, they get first dibs on all the best businesses as well. You know, like they get first dibs on like, he, like he, I think he loves hearing what's going on in terms of business and what people are doing. And, and, uh, and he's just a very social person. Um, now, when he was in Dublin uh, for the Pendulum Summit, I took him. I played tennis with him. I went to the dinner with him that evening, and uh, that was the first time I'd kind of seen him in that environment where, like, literally everyone was coming at him with with their kind of, you know, thirty second elevator pitch or whatever, you know. So, so that was. Whereas on Necker, it's his home, and he's kind of a bit more. He's he's um, he likes hearing. He does like hearing ideas, like, but. Um, it's obviously I'd say it's well. inspiring though to be around somebody like that and people like that and just kind of broadens your mind a bit and makes you think maybe makes you think bigger yeah I, I mean I hope so like I think um, I've definitely learned a lot from him and I've learned a lot from the people that come through the island as well it's not I mean you meet some incredible entrepreneurs that, that come through there some incredible business people um, and you're lucky to obviously spend time with these people in a relaxed environment where you're having you know you might be having drinks with them or or so playing tennis or hanging out so you can't you can't not be inspired by 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 some of these people you know like um now there's people who aren't maybe as financially successful who are equally inspiring like so i'm not saying that money is the driver but like just with with richard for example like his his get up and go and his just ability to to he just yeah, I mean, his, his, uh, as he always says, you know, screw it, just do it. Um, yeah, it's his kind of his zest for life or something, you know? It's like, he's, you know, he's definitely a unique, unique person. It's, it's something that you, interesting you said at the beginning as well, that he's, it's kind of non-negotiable to do the, the physical things. And I thought about this, that like the majority of my week has been in this room because it's where I'm working. And I've, yeah. So I've been like getting up, going straight to this, uh, this place. I might go to the gym, like, in the evening, that's kind of my only outside time. And then I thought to myself, I had this crushing thought today that most of my life is in this room. That's a weird thing. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. And like, if you broke up the percentage, 
uh, percentage of my waking hours, I'm just sitting in this room all the time. I think that's yeah. it. I don't know. If there's, you know that's that's obviously COVID related, yeah. you know. But but even without COVID, that, that's a, a lot of people's life is in the same spot. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. I'd say, if you can get out and go for a walk, even or just that's one thing I find with 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 um, the current situation is like you know, you can kind of become stale in the same spot. You know, I kind of miss going to coffee shops and meet. it kind of sparks ideas and stuff. You mm. know, you kind of lose that a little bit. Um, I miss the collabor- a collaboration with people. Do you know, I, w- I love to get into a, an office and just, if, even if it's not in my, um, in my kind of line of business, but as someone in work that I know, if they're having a problem, we go whiteboard it. And you got it. Yeah. On, and now it's very functional. Uh, the work exactly, that I'm doing. Yeah, you, you have your slot on, on Zoom or whatever it is, you know, it's yeah. a little bit, yeah but uh no he like yeah so I, I like with him i would have i definitely would have um and like obviously virgin has been you know they've been hit pretty hard but i have to say like he um uh, he's been great to me like i mean he's been he's just been phenomenal to me um, and one thing i did one kind of lesson i learned as well just around ideas I found it quite interesting actually because uh, he would always say to me that that people pitch him all the time you know and uh, which which they obviously do and he was saying like I think he told me a story where he was in, he was doing some cycle in South Africa and he was like <laughs> struggling up this hill, right? Like couldn't get up this hill on the bike and like some guy like sped up beside him and was like, Richard, I've got this idea. And he was like, would you ever just piss off? Like and leave me alone. But like, motorbike. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, um, but I said to him, I said to him one day, uh, like over a drink, 100% joking. I was like, um, I've I've got the perfect pitch for you, and he's like, oh, well, you know what's that? And so I'm six six, and the guy, a guy who was with us in the group, six 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 as well. And I said, anyone who's six foot six or above, you got to upgrade them automatically on Virgin Airlines. I'm like, I'm tired of sitting at the back of the plane. You know, I was traveling for for years as a tennis player, and you have all these free seats, and you're crammed in, and blah, 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 you know, and I was, like, 100% was not being serious at all, like, it was just a complete joke, like, expecting that, and obviously a couple of people laughed, and he was like, yeah, that, that, that's interesting, um, uh, email that to me, will you? <laughs> so I, I was like, okay, uh, uh, and then that evening, I played tennis with him, actually, and he, 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 we were, or the next day, and we were, he was chatting about it, he was saying, like, you know, tell me about that, and, and, I was just saying my experience of obviously I traveled 35 weeks a year telling about my experience on different airlines. And, um, he's written publicly around like how, when he's traveling, he carries a, a, a like a, a book and a, a little book, a notebook in his back pocket that he can kind of take ideas and stuff. And, uh, so I emailed it to him and then about a week later, so I, I then left Necker and about a week later, I got an email from him and it said, uh, and it was CC was the CEO of Virgin Airlines. And it was like, could we start upgrading on top of tall people on Virgin? Uh, it could be funky for the brand. What do you think? And I'd say this guy gets this email being like, oh, Jesus, like, you know. What is it? You know I, <laughs> but, but then when I was with, it was like, this is going back a couple of years now. And it, like two years ago, I remember I, I was with him in London. And, and he said, oh, yeah, we're, uh, I said to we're trying to we're trying to do that a little bit more. And uh, but for me, it's like, you know, something that's just a throwaway comment that he actually does something about it, like, and he carries it out and carries it through. Oh. So I thought it was quite interesting, quite interesting, like. It's class. And then, so what, right now you're, you have the, the high caliber uh, collective. That's the, yeah. the main business. Um, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe let the people know exactly what that, what that's all about. Um, and, uh, and that. Yes. Yeah. So that, that's kind of a, it's an evolution of, and that's why I said about the Branson piece was when I was over there, uh, Basically, I had this idea, like I loved meeting the people that were coming to the island. And I came back to Dublin and I started High Calibre Collective. I started doing events where I was bringing CEOs together. And that really led to kind of me going into organizations, doing executive coaching. So one-to-one coaching, team programs, uh, and then a lot of speaking stuff. And that was kind of pre-COVID. And then basically what happened was I had this idea in the back of my mind about where I saw the business going and what I wanted to do. And it kind of came from, I gave a talk, um, it was about 100 people, and I, I just had this kind of epiphany where I was like, there's probably, there's probably 30 people sitting there that do not want to listen to me, <laughs> that have no interest in listening to me. So the whole idea was like, how do you give people autonomy around their learning and development? 
but I didn't want it to be kind of an online course piece, like a, a wearable or an online course. And like, there's loads of that stuff. So what I did was create this learning and development platform where essentially, you know, people are working remotely in person stuff is obviously a struggle at the moment. So um, companies, they're buying packs of credits from me. And so a company takes a pack of credits, they assign, so they give credits. So they might give a thousand credits to one person and 500, it's up to the company to decide. And then the person, the individual um, goes onto the platform and they have the opportunity to work one-to-one -one with sessions so they can sign up for, so nice. it's across, you know, executive coaching, financial coach, um, clinical psychologists, yoga teachers, strength and conditioning coach. So all the areas of wellness, about 30 experts on there. So you can sign up for one-to-one -one sessions and then also experts are giving webinars. So they'll, so to the company that's on the platform, there's a communication saying sign up for nutrition webinar next Wednesday. Um, and then you use obviously only a small number of credits to sign up for the webinars. So I've got a couple of, couple of companies on board with that. Um, and I'm really looking to, to, to build that out. And, and, and I have a strong, I feel like a tennis player now and I'm kind of starting out. I'm trying to climb the mountain again. So uh, I'm very excited, uh, excited about it. And is, sorry, go, Mark. No, Mark, go for it. No, I was just wondering who's who's your target market essentially. Well, I know it's it's obviously people looking to, to perform at a high level and learn and progress. Mm -hmm. But like mm -hmm. from a company perspective, like what size companies, uh, where? Yeah. yeah. So at the moment, I've uh, I've an energy company, a betting company. You know, I'm trying to figure that out a little bit in terms of my in terms of my niche. Um, I'm speaking to a few tech companies as well. So I'm I'm really yeah I'm really looking at companies that are looking to support their su to support their employees. Um, it should be I every should, company, really. I'd imagine. Yeah, well, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's um, kind of and yeah, I'm t I suppose I'm trying to figure that niche out a little bit. Like at the moment, I've kind of you know I've a couple of tech companies, um, and I'm trying to figure that. I'm trying to crack that in terms of where exactly I'm targeting. If it's you know if it's smaller teams, if it's wider organizations um but the feedback has been incredibly positive like and uh, you know people really like the piece around the autonomy that that if someone if someone has a thousand credits and they're running a virtual mar a marathon in six weeks and they want to work with a nutritionist then let them go and do that if they're struggling with their nutrition in terms of work if they want to work with an executive coach and they've never done that before then let them do that um, so I think it, 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 uh, I've definitely tapped into something with it um, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm really excited to kind of bring companies on board and, you know, obviously grow the, grow the business. And um, with the companies, would that be, could that be part of a, a benefits package that, a, that, that somebody gets when they join a company? Definitely. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. I know, you know, that's one thing I know a lot of the tech companies will give a learning budget to, to an individual. So I think, you know, companies say like Adobe give, I think, a thousand euro to an employee is a benefit to, to, to go and spend on personal development. So, so um, yeah, so, so kind of tapping into, into that, 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 that it's essentially a one-stop shop for an individual that they can go onto the platform and they can, and they can work with who they want to work with um, all around. Like I kind of looked at the eight areas of wellness and, and I've kind of built out the experts based on that. Um, and and uh, yeah, give people the opportunity to, to, to choose who they want to work with. What are, what are the eight areas of, of wellness? So so physical, mental, spiritual, financial. Um, you're stumping me now. I have it on the wall there. Financial, <laughs> social, physical, intellectual, emotional, environmental, occupational, and and I'm back at spiritual. Yeah. So those eight areas, and I basically have that, and I'm like, okay. In terms of experts, you know, trying to fill fill those that 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 someone that when they come on that they're actually they can work with someone um, in, in that area. So the option is again with your credits, you can work on a one to one session, um, or you can use your credits to sign up for a webinar with 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 an expert. Such a good idea! It's really Such good. Idea. There is mm. so much, and I can tell you, so so, working, anyway. <laughs> um, working in a uh, a tech company. There is an incredible amount of leftover um, kind of tuition money. Like, for instance, I've never used a penny of mine, and I'm there almost four years. That's like, whatever. Oh, come on, I gotta get you on the. I gotta get you on the platform then. Yeah, no, like, I, I, people have said that to me. Like at the moment, I'm kind of going after companies with, with, um, yeah, looking to, 
for their employees. And I think at the you know currently the environment we're in, you know, supporting people remotely is, mm. and we're 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 in this situation. We're going to be in this situation for the foreseeable. Um, and you know, there's a lot of. I mean, there is products out there that are more kind of online courses and and you know wearables and all that stuff. Um, but I I my I guess my mantra is like you know almost that it's personal that you're actually speaking to someone that you have an interaction with a person whether it's in a group in a webinar or whether it's in a group session or in a one to one. I just think that's the most powerful thing. Like it's something that can really change someone's life here, coaching them directly. Do you know what I mean? People can yeah. be met. Like we, we had a, a talk in, the, on, in HubSpot. Uh, it was actually Brezzy. Do you know Brezzy? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was doing a talk on mental health. On mental health. Uh, and it was really good. Um, but I, uh, it was for everybody there. And it was, I know it was quite broad. And I was, I'd imagine maybe that's a bad example because he's a little bit uh, kind of high profile. So he might be better off with that kind of uh, broad approach. But imagine if, you know, you could book some time in with a mental health person one-on-one mm-hmm. and talk about specific issues that you want to talk about. I think that's incredibly powerful. And um, like, yes. like I, I've met with a few people who went to my old college about, you know, what, what like career advice and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's helped them kind of <laughs> avoid some of the mistakes that I did when I left college and that type of thing, you know, and it's, yeah, 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 no, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, I have a financial coach on there, right? So like, that's a, that's one that, you know, I think that's a good person to have as well. I mean, we can to have a confidential chat around finances and how you're saving or wanting to buy a house or sell a house or whatever, you know, that, that, that kind of, that, uh, that can eat away at someone as well. And especially in the current environment. So, um, yeah, so as I said, I have a couple of companies on board, and I'm, I'm uh, the companies I have currently are there's not like I'm I'm there's kind of a, at the moment I kind of went after a spread of companies really you know there's, there's I haven't specifically gone after like just purity tech or purity pharmaceutical it's kind of I've gone after a spread of companies at the moment but um, from from the companies I've spoken to feedback has been really really good like. Perfect. Well, we wish all you the best of luck with that. We do have a tradition on the web or on the um, on the shark bot here. And um, believe it or not, we've gone uh, a little bit more over time than we thought we would because we were talking about you two for about fifteen minutes. Before. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, yeah. Sorry, but, uh, it's it's all good. Mark, what do you think? What top five uh, lightning round questions here for for James uh, this week? Jeez. What do you think? Here we go. Okay, lightning. Okay. Um, what's your favorite social media and why? LinkedIn. Is oh, that why? the what's, what's my favorite social media platform? Like, yeah, yeah. Well, LinkedIn, yeah, LinkedIn. Is social media. That's the first yeah. time anyone's ever said that. Yeah, That's, I think it's more professional than 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 the other ones. Yeah, but it is it is professional, I guess. <laughs> no, for most for most people, I've seen some dodgy stuff on it. Um, what time do you get up at in the morning, and what time do you go to sleep? Uh, I would get up ten to six. And then sleep-wise, yeah, I would wake up early. Like sleep-wise, I'd be in bed at ten o'clock, but asleep probably eleven. Like I'd probably watch something or li- I listen to a podcast. So I'd have to listen to your guys' podcast. I'm not <laughs> yeah, going to listen to myself, but <laughs> just, <laughs> <laughs> just on repeat. Just that, I, yeah, I get it. Um, if you could do business anywhere in the world, where would it be? Uh, Necker Island. <laughs> <laughs> The first time we've had that very one. unique answer um, how much money is enough money once I can pay the bills and, and have a couple of holidays a year and stuff then I'm happy um, is it who you know or is it what you know Ooh, good question I'd say both am I Equally. allowed to that? Yeah, yeah, you could say yeah, that as well. Yeah. But we've had a lot of different answers for that. Uh, your friend Rob Cullen, who uh, actually introduced us um, from Dublin Chamber, said uh, we're asking the wrong question, and me and Mark were like, "Okay, well, you know, it's standardized questions here, Rob. So uh, you know, yeah, yeah. just you know, answer the question." <laughs> he said, <laughs> "He said, uh, you know, it, you should be asking like, who knows you? That should be oh, the yeah, thing." Yeah. So he kind of got meta on us, which was also a good answer. But <laughs> good, okay. Yeah, Rob. If you if you could advise someone to learn one skill, what would it be? Public speaking. Okay, 
And yeah. did I think you elaborate I, on that? Did, did you, did you le- learn that yourself? Or? No, so I took a class in America on public speaking. And I think like, on present, I'd say presentation skills is probably the best way of saying it. I think like in Ireland, I think we don't do a great job on that. Like I think in for kids in school, I think we don't do enough kind of group presentations and all that sort of stuff. And I think, you know, my experience in America and traveling and stuff, I just think, especially in America, like, geez, they're so used to getting up and yeah. speeding off something like, and, and they're just very good at it. Like, and I think we could, as a country, I think, I think it was like, well, I'm not sure of the source, but Ricky Gervais was like, people's number one fear is public speaking. And number two is death. So people, he's like, people fear speaking in public more than death, you know? So it's like, it's something that people are very apprehensive about. And I think if they do it as a kid and they, they learn it in school, if it was like a subject or something, I think it's, it give you everyone needs to do it at some point, you know? Yeah. If you get exposed to it, like anything, if you're exposed to it at a young age yeah, or bit by yeah, bit, yeah. it's it yeah, maybe, like, big impact. maybe schools have changed now. Maybe they do stuff. Uh, my experience wasn't yeah. like, it was, you know, you're, you're, you're learning but, your, Okay. We've all seen the the best man absolutely sweating buckets, you know, yeah, his whole day, day ruined and he's had to give a best man speech. Yeah, yeah. I, we actually uh, not this a, guy though, Luke. Yeah, Mark, <laughs> my best man. He uh, he nailed it. Uh, he really made a show of me. It was great. But um, the a couple of years ago, we were doing a a, a live event within HubSpot um, for it was in uh, Stockholm, I think, and we were organizing Jeez, you love Stockholm, huh? Yeah, I'm going to stop. You do bootleg and yeah. <laughs> maybe that's why I wanted to hold it there. Anyway, so we we, we arranged it uh, in Stockholm, and we were doing a hype video. You know, like uh, you know, as part of the marketing, the marketing team wanted the sales team to do that, and there's a mixture of Irish people and obviously Nordic people, but uh, Irish people and Americans on the team. And you could, we had like a. I wonder if I can post that on uh, our shark. Uh, our shark Instagram, you can see the difference for public speaking between the Irish people. Uh, mix in with the Americans. It was a yeah. completely different thing. It'd be like the Irish people, um, including myself, was just it was very you know informative. Um, yeah. The the Americans were like they were selling it, you know, yeah. uh, and they didn't have no shame or anything. I think that's what we yeah. need to get away from. Oh, so. definitely, yeah. yeah. They're, they're great. They're great. You know, generalized. They're great public speakers. Like, and they just do mo- so much more of it in school. Like, yeah, it's kind of like they want to get out there. But you know, uh, I think we're getting better at that. I think uh, you know, even we've had. Some, uh, people on the podcast that are uh, big on like um, YouTube and big on uh, on TikTok and stuff, and you know, Irish people are, are getting a lot better at that. But yeah, we do have yeah. we do have one more question for you. Okay, this is an important one. You got to think about this. All right, would you prefer <laughs> would you prefer a T-shirt that looks like this or a mug, jackpot mug mug? What do you think? Uh, well, this is an absolute no-brainer for me. Yeah. It's it has to be the T-shirt. Okay, that is on its way to you, uh, James. Do you, do you have a seven XL? <laughs> so we're gonna have, we're gonna get that. Uh, we're gonna get an XL extra long for this guy up here. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Uh, we'll, we'll get that. It's actually American sizes, so the extra large will be giant. So, <laughs> or, uh, something like a T-shirt to sleep in in the winter or something. We'll get that out to you, James. Thanks very much for oh, joining us here. Yeah, at Shackle. Cool. Thanks, thanks you, James. No worries. Thank you. Done. Brilliant. Is that okay?